Hey, I want to thank you all for viewing this uh, teaching, video teaching. Uh, the topic of this teaching is called Adam Kicked Out of Heaven, the Garden of Eden. And if you hadn't seen the last video, I suggest that you go ahead and see that video. Where is Eden? If you think that Eden is on earth, you have already fallen for the smoke screen that Moses left in terms of the rivers of Euphrates and Hevela and all of that stuff. I'm telling you that was placed there to throw you off a path. So in this session, we're going to do a little bit of a, of, of a review and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about Adam. So we want to review from the Where is Eden teaching. And in the video teaching, Where is Eden, we covered these points. First, we wanted to understand God's purpose for Moses' writings. Why did Moses write the things that he wrote? Why did God want to use Moses to write the things that he wrote? Excuse me. Secondly, we wanted to understand Moses' mindset regarding his writings. This is a very important thing to understand because Moses came out of a culture thirdly we want to we wanted to examine what God did when he created Eden and then lastly we wanted to understand the location of Eden we'll uh, gloss over some of those points here and I may end up doing that video teaching over because I may want to add to that. I may want to uh, be a little more detailed so that you can see some things more clearly. But in this video teaching, I want to start to bring to light why it is important for you to understand where Eden actually is. So let's review. Moses spent 40 years as an adopted member of the Pharaonic family until he murdered an Egyptian. And any serious Bible student understands that. I told you that the purpose for which the scriptures point out the fact that Moses received an elite education in the Egyptian religion was solely for God's purpose. The book of Acts 7.22 says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and he was proficient in speaking and action. And I'm reading that from the New American Standard Translation. So, Moses received the highest education that you can receive in Egypt in the time where he was an adopted member of the family of Pharaoh. So what you need to understand is for the Egyptians, the God Thor was the founder of all major disciplines such as science, religion, philosophy, and magic. That is the Egyptian belief. And Moses would have learned all of these disciplines. And this is exactly what is meant when Acts 7.22 says Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. So God called Moses from a burning bush. And in Moses' call, God gave him an assignment. 
And that assignment was not only to be used to free the sons of Israel from Egyptian slavery, but Moses also taught the sons of Israel God's ways. So how do you think God used that elite education that Moses received? That's a question that you should be asking yourself when you read certain things. God could have used anybody or anyone he wanted to use, but he chose Moses. And that is a significant point to consider. You see, the sons of Israel had been living in Egypt and in the Egyptian way of life for no less than 80 years. And, and it's definitely more than 80 years. I'm just giving you the time span of Moses' life from the time of Moses' birth until the time that he died. The sons of Israel was at least... And that's the least amount of time that they were in Egypt, but definitely not 400. And you can't tell me that the sons of Israel were not adapted or grafted into the Egyptian culture. In fact, they proved themselves to be repeat offenders following the ways of other religions, such as the Canaanites. And you will find a sprinkle here of Babylonian, but you will most definitely find them following the ways of the Egyptians, even to the point where Moses goes up to the mountain of God to get to receive the Ten Commandments and the children of Israel. Uh, deceives Aaron and I don't even know if you can call it a deception but they had Aaron create them a golden calf that's out of the Egyptian religion so we can't ignore the fact that God found Moses' knowledge of Egyptian wisdom as a significant piece to his overall plan for what he wanted to teach the sons of Israel and what he wanted them to understand. Yahusha states it best this way. He says in John 5 verse 46 and 47, if you believe Moses, you would believe me for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So how did Moses think when he wrote the things that he wrote? Moses wrote like an Egyptian. And it is no surprise that you find Egyptian concepts and ideas in the writings of Moses. People who study uh, Kemeticism accuse the Bible of copying from Egypt all the time. But fools are what they think. You see, God had his agenda in mind, and he knows that the best way to teach a child is to do so by using comparisons, parables, and imagery. Sadly, those who study Kemeticism fail to realize that even the bulk of the Egyptian religion is imagery, hieroglyph. Glyphics on the walls, uh, pictures of them in conquest over other kingdoms, them bringing slaves in to serve what the uh, Hebrews look like and what the 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 Indo-Europeans look like. And what the Nubians look like. All of that can be found in the imagery on the walls, in the pyramids, and <clears throat> in these uh, burial places in Egypt. So they even use imagery to explain their stupid notion of the activities of the gods. 
of the Egyptian gods. And Elohim knows that mankind can't understand spiritual ideas without comparisons. And if you think you can, you are dumber than I thought. Because you can't. Your eyes can't perceive the realm in which God resides. So he uses imagery to explain things to you. For example, the Egyptian god Osiris was pictured as a grain of wheat. This is Egyptian imagery that sprouted from the ground. And when the Egyptians ate bread, they believed that they were eating the, the body of Osiris that was made from wheat and that bread also depicted and was depicted as truth this is a concept that you can find throughout all the new and old testaments and god found it useful to take these concepts and use it to teach the children of israel so with that bit of information as review, let's read the account, the creation account in Genesis chapter one. And this will be my translation. I took a, a, a little time to uh, go through the original text. It says here in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth and the earth was formless and empty and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the wind of Elohim caused a shaking upon the face of the waters and Elohim said let there be light and there was light and Elohim saw the light that it was good and he Elohim will make a distinction between the light and between the darkness and God called the light day and to the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning a day one and Elohim said, verse 6, let there be an expanse in the middle of the waters and let it cause a distinction from between the waters from the waters. And Elohim made the expanse and he caused a distinction between the waters that was from below the expanse and between the waters that was from above the expanse. And it was so. And Elohim called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a day too. And Elohim said, let them, the waters under the heaven, gather to one place and she will appear the, gr the dry ground. And it was so. And Elohim called the dry ground earth. And to the gathering of the waters, he called seas and Elohim saw that it was good. And Elohim said, let her, the earth, bring forth greenery, the herb from seeding seed, fruit trees yielding fruit after his kind, who has his seed that is in himself upon the earth. And it was so. And she, the earth, brought forth greenery the herb from seeding seed from his kind and the and the tree yielding fruit who has his seed that is in himself from his kind and Elohim saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning a day three and Elohim said let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to cause a distinction between the day and between the night and let them be for signs and for appointed times and for days and years and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to cause light upon the earth and it was so verse 16 so Elohim made two great lights, 
the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. So Elohim set them in the expanse of the heavens to cause light upon the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to cause a distinction between the day and between the night. And Elohim saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning a day four. So what do you need to know from this account? On day two, God made an expanse and he made that expanse to separate the waters from above and the waters from below. And he called that expanse heaven. Now, many of your Bibles, is, it's translated firmament. But it should be translated expanse. A spacious area. An extended area. And he called the expanse heaven. Then on day four, God created two lights. The sun and the moon. And he set them in in the expanse that he called heaven why to cause light upon the dry ground which he called earth and so we have here three levels of the expanse that is called heavens the first level is the area where the birds fly the second is the area where the sun and the moon is set. And the third is the area where Elohim resides. It says, let the Lord, the, then the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind whom I have created from the face of the land. Mankind and animals as well. And crawling things. And the birds of the sky. This is Genesis chapter 6. And when it says. And the birds of the sky. That translation sky. Is. Deceiving. Because the Hebrew word. Is. Shemaim. It's the word. That we translate as heavens. So the birds. Flying in the heavens now any third grade kid will will be able to tell you that birds fly in the area in which we can see what what we call sky the hebrew text in the original called heavens and the rest of this uh, verse says for I am sorry that I have made them so the first level of heaven is the area in which the birds are flying the second area is this so Elohim made two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. So Elohim set them, that is those two great lights in the expanse of the heavens to cause light upon the earth. And you should already know that the sun and the moon and the stars reside outside of the area of earth in which we can see. It's only and it was only made possible for us to confirm that the sun was outside into space expanse. By NASA and 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 their. Uh, travels to the moon so what you see out in space 
the galaxies, the stars, the different planets. Moses already talked about in Genesis chapter 1. So while the Egyptians were comparing their version of heaven to the Nile Delta, Moses was getting his information from Elohim and he already knew that the moon and the sun was set outside of Earth's realm, the area in which we can see. And that last area of heaven is found in Psalms 11, 4. It said, the Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyelids test the sons of mankind. So this is the area in which we can't see. And Moses said, the reason that God created that expanse or firmament was to separate waters that are above and waters that are below. And he called that expanse heaven. We can't see this realm where God resides because it's a metaphysical realm. It's beyond the ability for our eyes to perceive, for our senses to perceive from this physical realm in which we reside right now. So if you want to know where Eden is located, you have to think like Moses thought and he thought like an Egyptian. The Egyptians, like I stated, used hieroglyphs to write their literature. Everything that you find about their gods were written down and, uh, using hieroglyphs. This is imagery. And this imagery explained their wisdom, what they considered wisdom. Moses also used imagery, among other things, to explain God's plan, but more specifically, Eden's location. When Moses wrote his depiction of Eden, the question is, how did he think? How did he teach the sons of Israel? Well, he taught them from the perspective of an Egyptian using the Egyptian heaven to explain how Adam and Eve was cast out of Eden. He used the concept of the Egyptian heaven called Aru, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, or the field of reeds which is the name for the heavenly paradise in the Egyptian mythology. Aru was usually placed in the east. I say that with significance. Placed in the east where the sun rises and has been described as comprising boundless reed fields, uh, fields like those of the Nile Delta. Consequently, this idea of hunting and farming ground enabled qualified souls, dead souls, to live for eternity. So what the Egyptians did was their idea of heaven looked like the, the area of the Nile Delta that had reeds a field of reeds, a lot of reeds. So they thought heaven was 
compared to what they saw on a daily basis. And that is the perfect smoke screen for Moses to use because he has a lot of people, archaeologists, religious folks, people in Christianity who are looking at the river Fison and Hevelah and Euphrates trying to see if they can find the Garden of Eden going on Google and looking at Pangea and all of these physical places you've been caught in the matrix matrix Moses has made you look in other areas to keep you from seeing the true area in which Eden resides, its location. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you where Eden is because it's important to understand. It is an important piece to what happened in chapter 3 with Adam and Eve and the serpent. Moses used, used these set of ideas that he got from his education in Egypt regarding the Egyptian field of reeds, a heavenly place, a heavenly paradise that was placed in the east, that they thought was in the east, in the direction of the light and souls. That's where they... If, if they were able to uh, travel with the, the god Afu-Ra, they called them, the Egyptians called the dead souls who were able to get in the boat with Afu-Ra, they called them the blessed dead because they were going to go from the west to the east and end up in the field of reeds, Osiris's residence. This is all imagery. But keep in mind, how Moses explains it is that Adam and Eve died. And as a result, God kicked them out of Eden Moses wrote this in Genesis chapter 2, I believe, verse 8. And Yahuwah Elohim planted a garden in Eden to the east, and there he put the man who he fashioned. That is in the direction where the light is located, where the light shines, the land of the living. You see, for the Egyptians, the underworld was a place of darkness and gloom where the dead dwells. But to the east, the field of reeds to the Egyptians was paradise. And it was considered the land of the living because the blessed dead, if they were able to uh, get in the boat with Afura, they were travel from the underworld, that place of darkness, and go towards the east where they would live forever engulfed in light. So Moses used this imagery to point to the place where Adam and Eve got kicked out of, of Eden because at that time, Adam and Eve died as a result of eating the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and bad. Elohim's realm is a metaphysical location. But that location is full of light because God himself is light. Not to be compared to the sun because God doesn't prescribe to you worshiping worshiping idols like the Egyptians did. 
and where God dwells, it is impossible for there to be darkness. Satan, the serpent, and the coming Antichrist. Now there's a prophecy about Satan that depicts him as the Antichrist and it also confirms that Satan was in Eden and that God was going to cast him down to the earth. This is Ezekiel 28. Let's read. The word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, Say to the leader of Tyrus, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of the of gods in the heart of the seas. Yet you are a man and not God, although you make your heart like the heart of God. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel. There is no secret that is a match for you. By your wisdom and understanding, you have acquired riches for yourself and have acquired gold and silver for your treasuries. By your great wisdom, by your trade, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your heart like the heart of God, therefore, behold, I will bring strangers upon you, the most ruthless of the nations, and they will draw their swords against you, against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. They will bring you down to the pit and you will die the death of those who are slain in the heart of the sea. Will you stay? Will you still say I am a God in the presence of your slayer? Though you are a man and not God in the hands of those who wound you, you will die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of strangers. For I have spoken, declares the Lord. Again, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation over the king of Tyrus and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Watch this. You were in Eden the garden of God. So by everything that I've writ read so far, you should understand that Ezekiel is using the king of Tyrus as a parabolic imagery to talk about Satan and the coming Antichrist says every precious stone was your covering the ruby the topaz and the diamond the barrel the onyx and the jasper the lap les the lap the lapis les lazuli excuse me the turquoise and the emerald and the gold the workmanship of your settings and sockets was in you on the day that you were created they were prepared you it should be are the anointed cherub who covers and I placed you there. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked in the midst of the stones of fire. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until unrighteousness or wickedness, as it says in the, the original translation, was found in you. By the abundance of your trade, you were internally filled with violence and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as profane from the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub. 
from the midst of the stones of fire. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. I cast you down to the earth. Now, this translation says ground, but it's eret. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Hebrew word, which is described as earth. I put you before kings that they may see you. By the multitude of your iniquities, in the unrighteousness of your trade, you profane your sanctuaries. Therefore, I have brought fire from the midst of you. It has consumed you, and I have turned you to ashes on the earth. Now, let's use a little bit of logic here. If this individual was in Eden and is now cast down to the earth, God going to cast him to the earth Elohim's going to cast him to the earth logic states that you can't be cast to the earth if you were already on the earth in other words he had to be in another location in order to be cast down to the earth <coughs> excuse me Jesus said to his disciples when they were coming back from ministering to the lost tribes of Israel. They said, oh, Lord, even the demons, they uh, respond to us. They respond to our authority in your name. Paraphrasing. And Yahusha says, I saw Satan. Cast down as lightning to the earth or from heaven. This is the same. This is the same uh, scripture verse or the same event that Yahusha is talking about here in Ezekiel 28. And as well in the book of Revelations, which it says the the Satan, that old Satan, uh, the adversary, was cast down to, to the ground, to earth. They're all talking about the same thing. So Eden is not located on the earth. If it was, there would be no need for God to cast down Satan if he already reside on the earth which he does not it says that he was in Eden and that is talking about heaven to finish out this uh, this chapter it says all who know you among the peoples are appalled at you you have become terrified and you will cease to be forever in fact Yahushua talks about this event in Luke 10 17 verse 18 the apostle John saw this event in his vision and wrote it in the book of revelations when he says and there was war in heaven Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon the dragon and his angels waged war and they were not strong enough and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven and the great dragon was thrown down the serpent of old who is called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world he was thrown down to the earth and his angels were thrown down with him. Revelations 12 verses 7 and 9. So it shouldn't be a surprise here. You can all stop looking at the river Euphrates. Looking at Pangea as 
an investigative moment and attempt to find Eden, Eden isn't on earth. Eden is in heaven in a realm that is metaphysical, which we cannot see. If we could, then we can go back. But as Ezekiel 28 says that that person, the Antichrist, was the covering cherub, who do you think or what do you think God placed at the entrance of Eden with the flaming sword going in every direction so that Adam and Eve could not find their way back to the tree of life and put out their hand and take fruit and eat and live forever. So Eden's location is heaven. Satan was there with Adam and Eve and Ezekiel prophecy his prophecy speaks on his coming demise. So now that you know that Adam was placed in heaven, the land of the living, now you are prepared to see how he died and what God considers earth, the place where we currently reside, what God considers it to be. But we'll do that in the next video. If you believe that you were edified by this teaching, don't miss future sessions. Go ahead, subscribe, hit that notification bell. And we'll have more on this topic going into the issue of Genesis chapter 3 with Adam and Eve.